I'm going to be introducing the first two speakers um, who are going to tell us a little bit about um, handwritten text recognition. So we're going to have Jacqueline Sandberg and Caroline uh, Pikoski from the McGill Library. Uh, Jacqueline is the outreach librarian at ROAR, the Rare and Special Collections Osler Art and Archives. And Caroline is the Metadata and Electronic Resources Librarian. Um, they will talk about how they have applied uh, handwritten text recognition on a couple of McGill's archival collections using the Cortex uh, platform and the kind of practical applications they've, uh, uh, they've encountered, the, 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 the technology, the, 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 sort of the challenges, and the best practice in terms of uh, using this technology um, to access archival collections. So I'm going to now um, hand over to Jacqueline and Caroline, and I believe we have a video from them. Uh, so good, good morning or afternoon, wherever you're joining from today. Uh, Jacqueline and I are delighted to be here with you to share our work on enhancing the discoverability and accessibility of handwritten text, applying handwritten text recognition or HTR to McGill University Library collections. This presentation will describe our process for applying HDR to two of our archival collections using the Cortex platform. So our next slide uh, now is going to show that first and foremost, the fundamental goal that has driven our work has been to make our collections more accessible. We're keeping all of our stakeholders and users in mind, from faculty and students to researchers both at and external to McGill, as well as members of the public. The value of these unique collections is tied to their use and discoverability, so ensuring that this collection is as findable and accessible as possible has been the why behind everything that we've done. And this is why we were committed to trying to apply HDR to our collections as one additional access point to these materials, along with cataloging metadata and the digitized images of the materials themselves. So with that in mind, I will now turn things over to Jacqueline to speak about the context and the specific collections we've been working with. So thanks, Carolyn. Here at McGill, we do have four rare collections under the umbrella of lore. That's rare and special collections, the Oslo Library of the History of Medicine, the Visual Arts Collection, and the McGill University Archives. The library has been collecting materials for a long time. We started in the 1850s, and now through purchases and donations, the holdings are rich research collections, including a great many manuscript materials and over 250,000 items unique in the world. So we invite the curious everywhere to discover our collections, but we have found that handwritten materials do present unique challenges and unique barriers to access. To this point, handwritten materials have really only been searchable by human eyes, requiring time consuming transcription and double checks or crowdsourcing and double checks to generate searchable transcripts. So for this pilot, we were excited about the potential of AI driven handwritten text recognition. And we chose to explore the options <laughs> because really handwriting can be a very major barrier. Our librarians have had experience working with students in the classroom setting. And it's just been eye opening to see that even history students who receive the most training and working with primary materials can be put off by the time and effort needed to make handwritten effective use of handwritten documents. So we're excited about the potential with HTR that would enable new search techniques. So we chose two collections. Um, the first one is actually this one, the Doncaster collection. It's 12 manuscript recipe books and over 1300 culinary and medical manuscript recipes. It dates from the 1790s through 1840s and mostly from the Doncaster area of South Yorkshire centered on Hooton Pagnell Hall. Why this one? Well, it's entirely manuscript and it's fairly small in size. So the scope was appropriate as well as the content. It was also the subject of an active research interest at the time. And as such, it was a good test case for transcription functionality because that project was generating the transcripts of their own that we could use as a comparison for the AI generated transcripts. So we ran with this and we published it in April of 2020 at a time, unfortunately, when all of us were focused on the growing COVID-19 pandemic. The second collection that we worked with is a collection of fur trade materials here at McGill. And this collection, it re includes records that document the finance 
Accounting and Administration of the Northwest Company. And the Northwest Company was active from the 1770s through about 1821, at which point it becomes more recognizable worldwide. It merged with the Hudson's Bay Company, which uh, has more name cachet, I believe, internationally. In many ways, the histories of those two companies are the history of European colonization in the landmass referred to as North America. Now, users can take a detailed look at the impact of the fur trade across the country through the lens of the documentary evidence. Account books, ledgers, estate documents, and correspondence. You can see James McGill's signature here. Although headquartered in Montreal, the Northwest Company extended its reach as far as the Pacific Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. In these records as well, Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous peoples were really a principal part of that fur trade. Um, and they were also, or sorry, they are also therefore present in these records, albeit indirectly. You can see on screen here um, that some different Indigenous groups are named in these documents. They are named by exonyms to be sure, but they are noted in the account books and the material also attests to the critical role of indigenous peoples in the fur trade. They were the primary providers of furs as also the crucial sources of knowledge for the European fur traders as they established their networks in North America. Letters of several of the company partners express the complicated nature of the relationship between the peoples. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that McGill University is located on land that has long served as a place of meeting and exchange amongst peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Roar honors, respects, and recognizes these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which McGill University stands today. Here we meet, study, and exchange ideas, but the legacy of those Indigenous peoples is here in this place as well as in this collection. And records of their knowledge and influence are listed here on screen in tidy black and white. As the archivist Tom Nesbitt writes, indigenous peoples provided technological, agricultural, military, cartographic, economic, medicinal, weather, and wildlife information. They are named, described, and extensively quoted, sometimes in their own languages, in the records. They were sketched and photographed and filmed, and the archives of their knowledge helped to create the archives of the Europeans that they encountered. This collection in particular is one of those in which we see the influence of Indigenous peoples. It also represents commercial, political, and social interactions between Anglophones and Francophones. And you can see that in some of the uh, employee contracts, which you see here in French, edited and redacted and <laughs> take a form contract and annotated by hand. So this was uh, one of the challenges actually for HDR recognition. But with that context, those are the two collections that we chose. I'll pass it back to Carolyn for a dive into metadata. Awesome, thanks Jacqueline. Um, so our goal was to take the Doncaster and Fur Trade collections and import them into the Cortex platform. And I'm going to take some time now to review the metadata considerations that were involved in the import and how we tried to make decisions that would allow the metadata to function as additional access points to the materials once they were within Cortex. The question, I think a good starting place is to ask where were these collections to begin with? And if we go to the next slide, you can see uh, a representation that the, the collections do exist physically, of course, at McGill. Uh, in terms of this work, I was uh, mostly concerned with how they're represented online in our archival catalog, which is uh, built with A to M. On this next slide, we're going to take a closer look at the James McGill form, which is part of our fur trade collection, as Jacqueline has described. And as you can see, there was already a lot of detailed metadata in that online catalog associated with the font and the individual items in these collections. And luckily this meant that um, the groundwork was really there. There wasn't a lot that I had to do to prepare this metadata for ingest into Cortex. Uh, now we're gonna take a look at where, where things ended up and where, where all this metadata is now. You're gonna see a snapshot of, of the mapping exercise that we did, which was primarily set up by my colleague, Megan Chelu, which was to help us get ready to perform the import into Cortex. So at this point, we were trying to pick and choose the most important or most used fields from, Ad, from A to M or Adam to carry over into Cortex, um, keeping in mind the user's experience and looking for ways to enhance their options for discovering the content via whatever different pathway they chose. 
you'll see um, sort of the final product of that mapping exercise, which was the final field mapping that was built up in Cortex. And it includes all the fields that we opted to include um, in, on each item's display in Cortex. We had two different field mappings, uh, so one for Doncaster and a separate one for Fur Trade. And while building the field mapping, we also spent time deciding which fields should be controlled vocabularies and which would be text fields. So the controlled vocabularies in Cortex allowed us to do things like create font level landing pages and allows for greater browsing um, opportunities overall for users. And later on, you're gonna see the controlled vocabularies. They sort of look, show up as little grayed out terms that are affiliated with each item in Cortex. If we go to the next slide, you'll see a representation of the work that I was doing um, to prepare some of the exported metadata. So essentially I worked with metadata exported out of the archival catalog. And then I edited that using a combo of Excel, Python, and as you see here, OpenRefine. And if we go uh, to the next slide, um, you'll see an example of an Excel file that's ready for upload into directly into Cortex. I dealt with just one font at a time in my case, so I, I only ever did about a maximum of 50 items at a time, but it, it would be possible to do more. Um, and I made some changes after this initial file upload uh, within Cortex, because that's an option using batch editing and some of their other features. So I would say as a, as a final note on metadata, the workflow we have is fairly well established now for future metadata transfers of the sort. And we would have a standard in mind for doing transfers at least into Cortex. Um, tools like Excel and OpenRefine, um, as well as Python, um, and as well as the batch editing that's available in Cortex, all ensure that this metadata is easy to work with and rework as needed. So at this point, we're going to actually take a step out uh, into the Cortex site and take a bit of a, a site tour through our, our, online, um, our online platform and the online exhibits that we have. So we're starting um, on the homepage of the McGill Cortex site. Uh, Cortex simplifies and automates our workflows for transcription, but we also use their tools to build exhibitions to accompany this material and to make the material available online. So the search box that you see on the home page will search across all of our collections. Um, but as we've mentioned, we started with one collection in particular, which was Doncaster. So we'll take a look now at the Doncaster specific landing page. Now that we have two uh, collections in, in our Cortex system, we're making use of uh, things called list pages, which is a website template that will build pages based on your controlled vocabularies or collections. This function makes generating pages simple, and it still allows you to customize the overall search options and appearance. And now we'll actually take a step over into our second collection page, which is the fur trade landing page. Um, and it's possible for users to also do more of a browsing uh, using the find function if they would prefer to do that. So we're going to take a look um, at within fur trade at how you could browse through our different phone pages. I'm James McGill. Oh, perfect. And we're going to jump in uh, directly, directly into our James McGill phone, which is one we've been discussing throughout so far. And finally, uh, we also wanted to take a look at our, our fur trade exhibition site, um, just so you can see what that, what that looks like to sort of bring these collections to life sort of all the more. <laughs> so if you click into the exhibition site, we're going to jump over to the second slide. Um, just so that you can see an example of how you can toggle to the full screen to get a, a better look at an image. And you'll, um, you'll see that there's also a, a nice image caption that's associated with, with the, the image so that you can get a bit of a description about it. The interface does let you embed other external links. So what we did here was embed a contemporary map showing the location that this fire plan corresponds to today, which is quite interesting. If you want to walk down to Old Port, you can see where these buildings stood. One of the other functionalities of the exhibition is that it is powered and linked to all of your assets in Cortex. So if you click on this related page, it takes you out to the actual contract of Jacques Rattel of L'Assomption, a voyager and who signed his name there uh, as I zoom in and out a little bit too quickly. His contract is there marked X at the bottom, but that's what the interface looks like when you look at an individual item. You have the summary here, you have the metadata listed below, 
with those controlled vocabularies that Carolyn pointed out in her comments, you can click through any of those and it'll take you into the list of related assets. And then the other thing that is important is, of course, you can look at the transcript right here. And the other uh, difficulty that our collection posed was, of course, uh, it's multilingual, it's in French and English, and it is manuscript, but also tab tabular manuscript data. So I worked with Cortex to select samples of for testing their HDR accuracy. I'm going to flip back to our slide deck now. And what we did was try to hit all of the major categories of material and to have a clean and messy example of each category. So a clean correspondence, a clean ledger, a clean map, a clean daybook, et cetera. And then what we did was create a clean and corrected transcript based on the transcript generated by the AI. Testing showed us that the generated transcript online, as if you were sees it here, doesn't actually show the line breaks that are in existence if you download the transcript. So that's one mismatch between the viewer experience and the downloaded transcript. And we found that the accuracy of detecting column breaks was actually quite high and character recognition is very high. But with the tabular format, the breakdown is in generating a transcript that makes sense in order because the line breaks do tend to really confuse the AI. Another thing that on this one that causes issues for the AI recognition of the handwritten scripts is actually the page curve at the binding. So we newly discovered the importance of very flat <laughs> and very clear digitized images. The, we use the historic handwriting script and HDR provided by Cortex does have different scripts that are better for different time periods. This is the corrected uh, transcript in process that we provided to Cortex so that they could test the accuracy character by character, word by word and line by line. And they did a lot of work and have all of the, all of the documented accuracy ratings for the test samples that we gave. This is an example of correspondence in a mediocre personal hand, which actually belongs to James McGill and the generated transcript is there. The accuracy ratings were variable depending on the legibility of the script, but overall impressive. And it opens up a, a keyword search across the entirety of the collection. So the one thing that breaks down, of course, is tabular data, especially with non-text um, characters. So things like ampersands or apostrophes or this sort of thing, they really did confuse and break down the legibility of the generated transcript. So for us, the project showed us that the hard work put in to make our archival collections available even through A2M is well worth it because that prepared the way for transcription workflows in this new software in Cortex. We've gained knowledge of the strengths and weaknesses of this particular AI-driven HTR throughout the pilot, and it gives us a new lens to look at our collections. We know what type of material returned the greatest character and word recognition, and we know also the inverse, what materials are better left to manual and human transcription at this point. I'll close now with some words from my colleague, Ellis Ng, who curated the Fur Trade exhibition along with us. As librarians and archivists, we can't possibly know all the potential uses of the material we care for, which is another reason why HTR and other developments can help overcome barriers to research are so valuable. We want to empower people to make use of the material in whatever way they want, rather than dictate the ways in which it can be used. Thanks for listening. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline and Caroline. Um, a really, really interesting. Uh, presentation. I'm sure we'll come back to some of the issues about um, transcriptions and the challenges. Um, some of this actually um, came up in this morning session with the programming historian and some of these approaches. So um, our next speaker is Jenny Bunn from the National Archives and Jenny is a uh, head of archives research. Um, she has over 25 years experience as an archival practitioner, educator, and researcher, and has been interested in the intersection and interplay between archives and technology um, throughout her career. 
So she's going to talk to us about AI uh, and the glam sector, uh, what it might mean. Is it a, uh, the, the latest craze uh, for the glam sector? So thank you, Jenny, and I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Paolo. Um, the, the title of this presentation was in, oh, I must introduce myself, sorry. I am a white woman. I'm quite short. I have brown hair. It's tied back. Uh, I'm wearing a blue and white, blue and blue pattern top, which is the same top I wore on Tuesday, if anybody was here on Tuesday. So that, that's me. Um, and the, the title of this presentation was inspired by an article by Terry Eastwood, which was called Nailing a Little Jelly to the Wall of Archival Studies. And in that article, um, Terry Eastwood set out to dismantle an edifice of ideas to see of what it is really made and whether it will stand up to close scrutiny. And in this presentation, the edifice of ideas under scrutiny is that of artificial intelligence, because in my opinion, this is something that badly needs pinning down. Um, these days, it is all AI this and AI that, um, and I, for one, am increasingly put in mind of the emperor's new clothes. So what follows is a personal reflection on the way I currently make sense of AI in the game. And I will be asserting a kind of definite view, but I do so not because I want to persuade you to the same view, um, only because I want to encourage you to take steps to inform one of your own. Um, when I'm asked kind of what is AI and I'm asked to define it, I choose to sort of do so in the terms on this slide. And as you can see, those terms are informed by looking back into the history of AI and to a summer workshop held at the Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, which is commonly regarded and by commonly regarded, I mean, i.e. by Wikipedia as the founding event of artificial intelligence as a kind of academic field. Now, the exploration that started at that workshop is still very much ongoing. And this hypothesis is still far from proven one way or another. But what is certain, however, is that as is the case with quite a lot of academic exercises, the knowledge and techniques developed as a result have found fruitful and profitable application in any number of world, real world contexts. And in this respect, another quote I particularly like is from Ralph Cornis, who wrote in the pages of the Records Management Journal way back in 1989, that artificial intelligence, which many saw as the wave of the future, will arrive by osmosis. Other branches of IT will steal its clothes. It is already starting to happen. Osmosis can be defined as the process of gradual or unconscious assimilation of ideas or knowledge. And it is this unconsciousness that I see as the problem. Given what we are starting to realize about the potential applications of AI, to remain unconscious of that assimilation seems to me to be asking for trouble. One of the first sort of new areas to spin off from the quest for AI was that of robotics. Now, this field has achieved considerable um, success in proving the hypothesis that one feature of intelligence that can be described in such detail that a machine can simulate it is the ability to follow a clearly set out procedure to get that is with the program. Um, indeed, machines can do so quite literally um, such that they are able to do so arguably more slavishly and consistently than any human ever would be able to. And because they can simulate this feature, they can and do perform routine and repetitive manual tasks, albeit under very carefully controlled conditions, because they are still not good at simulating that feature of intelligence that allows us to react to something unexpected happening, like a bike suddenly veering in front of our self-driving car. More recently, another spin-off from the exploration of artificial intelligence has been the field of machine learning. And the feature of intelligence that machine learning simulates is our ability to process data, to iterate models that allow us to make judgments or predictions on the base of similar data in the future. So to some extent then, this could be seen as learning by experience, but in the case of machine learning, that experience is exceedingly limited in range. But even so, the machine simulation of this feature has advanced to the extent that it already mimics the almost unconscious internalization of the arrived at model, which leaves many experts unable to explain fully why and how they have come to those conclusions or by those insights. 
Then again, the simulation also mimics the well-known problems of reaching any conclusion on the basis of data that is inaccurate, incomplete, and or unrepresentative in some important respect. Training and refining these machine mental models takes a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of data, but models have now been created that do allow machines to simulate perhaps more advanced features of intelligence, such as the ability to parse natural language or to recognize an object appearing in an image. So as the phrase goes, fake it until you can make it. Um, but while the machines may now be able to fake it, actually what we make of it is still up to us. Um, when, when, what then should we make of it, I guess, is the next question. And to start to answer this question, I feel it's instructive to think about what others are making at it um, and what many people are making at it. Um, in particular, perhaps the big players in technology is another service that can be sold to us. So as to why we might want to avail ourselves of this service, down the right, you can see a list of the sort of things we are being told we can achieve if we choose to employ the power of these new services. So in the glam sector, we may be less interested in fraud detection or combating financial crime, but achieving the last two in bold, I would say, fall very much kind of within our sights. So knowledge mining, according to the sales pitch, involves uncovering latent insights. This is absolutely one of the things we want to facilitate. As GLAM organizations, we know that our collections are cram full of latent insights. That's partly why we put so much effort into preserving them such that this latency can be realized. Document process automation, on the other hand, involves turning documents into usable data at a fraction of the time and cost by automating information extraction. Particularly, perhaps in the more archival parts of the GLAM domain, we have more documents than we can possibly process using manual methods. But it's also kind of generally true, I think, that the holdings of GLAM organizations quite often are not usable data in that sort of digital data science way of things. So that's big technology players. What about GLAMs? Um, so here we have the results of a project which show that um, knowledge extraction and metadata quality are two of the main reasons why GLAMs are interested in AI. And they're also, of course, the areas where its application has been found to be most useful. Now, these two are, of course, related. Um, because knowledge extraction or mining, whether it is AI assisted or not, is always ultimately dependent on data quality. And this connection may also explain why the potential of AI is seen perhaps most as pertaining to the application areas of collections management and discovery and search. So this is where GLAM is currently focusing its attention in relation to AI, with possible applications such as audience analysis and machine translation still of interest, but not as much. So nailing a little jelly to the wall then, let us narrow our focus accordingly and to look at um, what we are currently making of AI um, in respect of one, turning our collections into usable data and two, uncovering latent insights. Um, first then, turning our collections into usable data. One thing that all GLAM institutions are very aware of is that spinning straw into gold is quite a resource intensive enterprise. The added value of our material curation and care ensures and allows others to realize all sorts of values from that material, be that cultural, aesthetic, emotional, informational or evidential. Ensuring and allowing this outcome has always involved material preservation, along with the collection and curation of lots of additional intelligence, information or metadata that allows the relevant material to be found, understood and sourced when required. With the arrival of new digital ways of processing, however, to be considered usable, all this material and information is now expected to be accessible in a new form, which is amenable to that type of processing. We are entering the world of, so to speak, collections as data. So spinning collections into data is a sort of constant background task and reality for GLAM institutions. And we are starting to make something of AI in this regard. For example, it is through the application of machine learning that projects such as Transcribers have allowed for leap forwards in handwritten text recognition, such as we've just been hearing about. 
Um, and this, this sort of handwritten text recognition allows for the spinning of such text into a digital form. And once so spun, this text in a digital form becomes amenable to another application of AI, that of natural language processing. And one project to try to make something of this was the um, Cybernetics Thought Collective project at the University of Illinois. So working on the digitized papers of leading cyberneticians, they use these techniques to automatically generate metadata such as percent sentiment scores. And you'll see some of these in a minute. I've introduced this metaphor of spinning straw into gold because it also allows me to talk in terms of a gold standard. All GLAM institutions want their collections to be both usable and used, and yet the gold standard of what is needed resource-wide to achieve the levels of usability that are needed, to attract the levels of use that are needed, to justify the level of resource expended in the first place, just keeps expanding. And, and I often find myself sort of asking, where will it end? So this then is me on a bad day. Um, I want to be helpful. I want to make my collection usable. But at what point does this become too big an ask or, or too impossible an ask? At what point do all those who are gaining the use of and value from all of this usability I'm generating need to sit down together and renegotiate where the work of and resource for usable ends and that of and for use begins? On a good day, though, I do recognise that this renegotiation is already happening. So it's happening, for example, in the way that academic funders and institutions are starting to acknowledge the need to cost in the work of so-called research technicians and by maintaining their own research data repositories to take on some of the cost of ensuring that value once gained is not lost again, by sort of in, but remains usable. It's maintaining its usability. It's available for reuse. So returning to the original question of what we are making of AI in respect of turning our collections into usable data, I think it is clear that we are making some progress with applying it to accomplish some sort of specific tasks in service of that goal, such as handwritten text recognition. But that in others, um, such as perhaps generation of metadata, our efforts remain at a much more experimental stage. So we turn then to what we are making of AI in respect of uncovering latent insights. As I mentioned previously, uncovering latent insights is to some extent what the glam sector is all about, certainly perhaps in terms of why it is seen to have public value. So what then are we making of AI in this respect? One answer to that question has already been hinted at, that we are only doing this indirectly, that what we in GLAM are making of AI are the means to automate the turning of our collections into data that is usable digitally, because we anticipate that this will lead in turn to the uncovering of latent insights. And numerous digital humanities, such as the one featured on this slide, would seem to suggest that our anticipation is justified. But perhaps a better question to be asking is what latent insights could AI help GLAM to uncover that are of more direct use to its practice rather than to that of research? Uh, my answer to this is that in its simulation of internal mental models on which to fu base future judgments or inference and its blunt surfacing of the uncertainty or if you prefer the subjectivity of that process in statistical and numerical terms, certain applications of AI force us to confront the fact the same is true whether these models are held by a machine or a human being. We've long been aware of the biases, uncertainty and absences within our collections, but perhaps we might now be able to develop tools to help us become more specifically aware of them, to quantify and communicate them more effectively to allow more informed use of our collections possible. Perhaps in raw informational terms, the machine generated sentiment score um, presented here is, is not that useful, but its presence and the questions that generates about the degree to which we can be confident in any judgments drawn from the material being described is nonetheless to my mind still helpful. So to conclude then, my view is that AI is an ongoing academic exercise to explore the hypothesis that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. In exploring this hypothesis, techniques and technologies have been developed that do simulate certain features of intelligence, which once simulated, allow for the application and development of machines to perform tasks which could previously only be undertaken by human beings. And in the GLAM context, the main task we are currently looking for machines to perform is the automatic 
datification of our collections, be this conversion into a digital form or where material already exists in a digital form, the conversion of it into more structured and refined digital forms. And once in these forms, the material undoubtedly becomes more usable, that is to say, usable in more ways, e.g. over greater distances or at greater scale. But whether automated or not, such conversions do not come cost or risk free. And we may all want to play with the shiny new toys, but we must not let this distract us from these costs and these risks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, very well made points. Um, I had a, a, a number of questions triggering um, in my mind about this, the, the expectations also that we, we have when engaging in this, um, the outputs of these technologies. But again, we'll leave that for, um, for later. So our uh, next speaker is Stephanie Decker. Um, who I think will be speaking on behalf of a number of colleagues uh, on the projects that they have worked on. Um, Stephanie is a professor of history and strategy at the University of Bristol and a visiting professor at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And she'll be talking about a piece of research that um, uh, uh, with her team, uh, they have carried out um, uh, with funding from the HRC on contextualizing email archives. And I have to say that uh, a part of the team members who have put together the presentation, but um, I don't think are speaking uh, with uh, Stephanie today, are Adam Nix uh, from the Birmingham Business School, David Kirsch, University of Maryland, and Santhilata Kupili Venkata from the National Archives, or I believe ex National Archives. Anyway, um, Stephanie, um, over to you. Thank you, Paola. Um, yeah, just to say, I don't normally sound like this. I'm on my third day of COVID, so, so my apologies for that. Um, maybe starting with the uh, visual uh, description you asked for. So uh, I'm a white woman in my 40s. I've got brown hair, chin length. You see me in my office with books in the background. I wear a, um, a black jacket and a brown turtleneck. So um, as Paola already said, I'm presenting here on behalf of our research team. So two of my team have joined us today. That is uh, David Kirsch and um, Shanti Kapili Venkata. Um, Adam unfortunately couldn't make it because um, he would have only been able to join later. So we've been working on, on a series of projects. The first one being contextualizing email archives together with the National Archives. Um, the second one, a project led by David in the US um, on the MCODIS tool, which is the one we developed in the first project. So, so they're largely uh, are projects dealing with the same issue, the same problem, which is what we'll be talking about today. So for DCDC, um, we, we've called this digitally curious context beyond the search window. Um, really what we're interested in is how will people actually interact with born digital resources when they come to collections and they seek to actually find material for research. It might also be, for example, um, other users in, in the GLAM context, maybe trying to understand what is in a digital resource. And um, the project and its questions really come from our own problems as researchers trying to, to figure out how will we make use of digital resources in the future. Hang on. Not quite sure what's going on here. Ah, there we are. Okay, so uh, our project takes um, a user perspective. Um, so this is somewhat different, perhaps, from, from some of the presentations earlier. For us, the question is really how born digital sources are going to be vital for future research that draws on, on historical ideas. So, so looking backwards in time, that might not only be historians, we all work in a business management school context, might also be cultural studies, literature, lot, lots of people want to go back to material in digital or non-digital um, collections. And our main problem at the moment is that a lot of these born digital collections remain inaccessible. So, so as a team, we've written a paper on this about the dark archives and what will happen if some of these archives actually become accessible. But at the moment, for legal reasons, um, researchers have very little opportunity to actually understand how they might want to research these resources that maybe some archivists and, and owners of collections already have, but may not be able to put in the public domain. That means they may not quite understand the ethical implications, but also the practical implications of how we would be using those resources, because 
Uh, most of us have just been trained on the use of physical and pre-digital sources. So other than people who work in a particular computing science or big data context, uh, for many of the rest of us, how will we actually make use of digital sources is not at all clear. And people have a lot of preconceptions, but not necessarily a lot of knowledge or opportunity to test it. So our research project tries to look beyond the current issues with preservation, which we understand are, are very significant. Um, arguments been made how they are shaking up traditional archival processes just because of the size and, and some of the, the privacy concerns with digital resources. Uh, privacy in particular for us here in the UK and Europe, GDPR is a particular issue, um, means that simply a lot of it can't be made accessible or can't be quite worked on in the way that maybe in the future we'll be able to. Lise Jayon has made the, the point that really to, to address this problem of access might require collaboration between um, those that manage the collections and those that ultimately want to use the collections. And this is sort of the spirit in which we've, we've tried to address some of the questions and, and our work um, and looking at access issues. Um, existing work, for example, from the Wellcome Trust has sort of argued users want optionality, but they still expect some curation from archivists because they're still inexperienced in the use. So that doesn't necessarily answer the question of how archivists will be able to provide that curation given the size of some of these born digital resources. So our key question in our project, in both projects really, has been around how users will actually engage with born digital material once these access issues have been navigated. Because from our understanding, working with these sources, the, the problems don't end with the moment that we actually get access to the digital resources. And at the moment, we don't know that because so many of them are not yet accessible. So our first research project, contextualizing email archives, was very much focused on exploring this gap between the current efforts to preserve and then the means by which researchers might actually want to engage with them. So, so what happens after they've been preserved? So for this, we collaborated with the National Archives. Um, however, we actually used uh, data that isn't in the National Archives um, because these are emails of a failed US.com company that um, David Kirsch is our collaborator, um, has already worked with in a research context and made these available for the research via the Linguistic Data Consortium. So linguistic data already tells you this is large scale, what's called non-consumptive use. So it's very much about modeling interactions and so it's a large scale data analytic use. So we collaborated with the TNA, with a digital archive specialist, especially Gentilata Kupili Venkase. Um, and our aim was really to, to look at how we can make email archives available for search and study whilst drawn on these relational network properties of the format that have been well researched, but actually also making use of them for people who might want to actually read the emails and know what people were saying to each other. And uh, we're particularly interested in emails because we think there's specific issues here. They're, they're network resource. So you could say emails replace co um, correspondence. That's not really true. It's more like almost a, a telephone conversation, perhaps, because it's the back and forth. So an individual email outside the context of its thread can be hard to interpret. So email is, but emails also are in the plural. Um, and also who's writing to whom, who's in the CC and who's in the BCC is, is not just cont is not just information. Um, it is actually also context to understanding the meaning of a conversation. So when we see non-historians or non-qualitative researchers look at emails, they often look at aspects such as frequency networks, timing and sequencing language or content, all of them in isolation. We see all of these as contexts we actually need to, you know, to, to interpret a historical source, obviously. Now, we particularly look at organizational email because we believe that they're going to be very useful historical sources. And for those in particular, you need the individual and the network aspects. A couple of other assumptions we made is really that, um, you know, how we approach something is not how everybody else will approach it. So we need to accommodate really diverse research questions. Users will probably work iteratively and might have the sort of tacit and somewhat messy approach that many historical researchers have. You go in with a general question, what you find determines how you rephrase the question. Uh, people will come at different levels of experience. And ideally, you want to offer them a relatively complete access to a whole corpus so they understand what's not there as well as what's there. And we try to sort of think about how does what we are proposing differ from how you might have previously accessed these sort of resources. So previously, you may have relied heavily on the archivist. 
you might have come in and say, okay, I want to know what's in here on e-business trends in the early millennium. It's definitely something that this, this source we looked at covers. You might look at finding aids or a catalog structure, probably ask the archivist if they know the resource. You might read closely, go back to targeted search. So, so you iterate backwards and forwards between a structure and what you find and how you begin to understand how the structure works for you. Now, in a digital resource, these structures are unlikely to be there or are not likely there in quite the same way. So say you come in with a search query, you, you know, your classic way of looking at a text resource might be to look at keyword search. So you'd look at e-business trends and the years. That doesn't necessarily give you the intersection of all of these themes. So the prototype we developed in the first um, project, which we call MCODIST, is trying to be a search tool that sort of closes this gap from, from like simpler search approaches. First option within that tool would be to use phrase matching, which allows you to draw all these terms together. But you know, there's also the problem of what if people didn't refer to it as e-business trends in that particular collection or at that particular time. So the MCODIS Plus version, uh, which uses attention-based content encoding, is trying to also bring up the synonyms and all these terms that were used maybe relatedly and which the tool should help us identify. So not knowing what terms to look for, the tool is supposed to fill that gap, though this, this is something that we're, we're currently in the process of testing how, how well that actually works. And in order for this to work better, we are trying to bring context in, so to really think about what do we know about a source and how can we use that to actually help such a tool to work. For this, we need some external sources of context in addition to the emails we talked about, something like an organizational chart, if we're looking at a, at a business context or an organizational context, known relationships between individuals, you know, are they all the same managerial level? Is this a CEO and the PA? Uh, are there market or geographic events? You know, an outside I might not know, but this, this and that happened in the source, and this is likely to generate a lot of emails that might be interesting, but they might not know the precise terms. So how can we make sure um, a, a new user can find that? And that's what we're trying to do with the MCODIST tool. So MCODIST stands for Email Contextualization Discovery Tool. And the idea is really that we can draw on different sources of, of context to help people find better results in emails. In our experience, the results you find when you search emails, not always that great, not always quite what you're looking for as, as a researcher. Um, in the second phase of, of our project, so, so we're on to the, the second project at the moment, um, we're really interested in how research would actually use this tool because, you know, it's all nice that we designed it, but A, does it do how we designed it? And is that actually what other researchers want? So um, we, we are currently working on a web-based web version of the tool for early August um, to then have an opportunity to review user behavior. So we're making it clear we're logging the activity to see how user-friendly, how well can they navigate the tool. We're requesting user evaluation through a short survey. And in particular, we're interested how users navigate their empty search box, because what we're assuming is there's a Googleification of search, right? You ask Google anything, you put it in the box, and it throws out an answer because it's got the totality of the internet. Now, obviously, with a digital resource, with a search box, you know, these resources are limited. And if you use the wrong terms, it's not necessarily going to give you any results. So this is one of the problems we anticipate. But we also want to see how will people phrase a query when they do not actually know what's in the resource, because that's the fundamental problem of uh, coming to a new research area, coming to a new archive. You never quite know what's in there. And without the traditional finding aids, potentially for digital sources, it'll be even harder. So for this MCODIS test version, we're using the Enron email corpus, uh, largely because obviously Enron is in the public domain. We don't have any of the privacy issues. Um, because all of this was made available and has been online for well over 10 years. The Enron uh, data set is also interesting in a different way, because Enron, obviously, if you know what Enron is, you know Enron because of the accountancy fraud. And if you come to an email data set and you want to read the emails about fraud, how do you type your query? I mean, you put in fraud and you expect to get all the emails about fraud. I mean, realistically, you know, people don't say they're committing fraud while they're committing fraud. So, so, so how do you find these emails? So th that's a good sort of idea around how do you how do you phrase any conceptual query that isn't a keyword per se? How do people do that? And what does a tool need to do to actually help them do that? 
Secondly, the Enron uh, data set is interesting because it's a little bit misleading. It was actually collected as part of the investigation into Enron's involvement in the California energy crisis, and that predated the accountancy st scandal. So while some of the emails relating to the accountancy scandal are in there, actually the collection was before that scandal broke. So this data set doesn't quite contain what people think it contains, and you actually need to know pretty well how this data set came to be in a public domain to, to, to know this, and most people won't. So again, and how far can a tool help people navigate a resource that they think they know something about, but probably don't know that much about, and that is not, as a result, going to throw out quite the results they're expecting. So um, this is sort of our, our ongoing projects. Um, MCODIST in particular is something that I think uh, we have on GitHub. So that's the link you have on the bottom of the page here, but that's not currently the, the usable version. So we're working on, on a sort of web hosted um, version to, to use from, from August onwards. Um, but if you're interested in, in the coding underneath, um, as I said, uh, it's under GitHub contextualizing email archives and, and you can have a look there. So, yeah, so this is our presentation. Um, I said this is on behalf of my team. Um, I'm Stephanie, uh, David and Shanti are here and Adam can't make it, but uh, Shanti is our technical lead, uh, can also answer any questions you might have on the more computing end of things. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, again, another really um, uh, interesting presentation that has a lot of links to the ones that we've heard before. Um, if I can just invite all the speakers to come back on video, please. And again, as we've been saying throughout the presentations, um, if you have uh, questions, please pop them into the Q&A uh, through the Q&A function and we'll just go through them. Are we all back? Okay, thank you. Um, just before we go into individual questions, I um, I just had a question for all of you, um, uh, thinking in different ways um, at the user side of things. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts or any reflections. Um, so for example, the first presentation in terms of the, you talked about the challenges of the HTR, uh, so applying that technique. And I was curious to know about um, uh, what users have thought about it, what kind of feedback you've got in terms of the, 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 the results and how people have been able to discover the text. But equally, Jenny, from your point of view, um, I think you made a really good point about striking the balance between the amount of resources uh, and, and what can then be expected as, as outputs. Um, again, what, what's your uh, understanding of uh, um, the, the sort of the, the approach and the reactions of, uh, of patients who might want to then use those data sets? Um, and equally for the email uh, projects, uh, I, I'm not sure if um, uh, others are now able to use the data sets that you have um, uh, sort of put together and analyzed. But so that kind of user perspective first, and then we'll go into something specific for each of the projects. Caroline and Jacqueline, do you want to go first? Sure. I'll. I'll take a stab um, at that. Um, one of the things with this collection is that tracking usage, we can have quantitative numbers generated by uh, Google Analytics tracking on the data, the website itself to see how many people have viewed, but we don't really have a mechanism in place for a qualitative feedback on the user experience. It's not something that we have actively tested. Um, so we don't necessarily have that subjective user experience apart from our own internal testing with our team on using the platform and that sort of thing. And I know that Adam, Matthew, and Cortex have a booth, and we could probably all go and visit them in the exhibition hall and ask more about other collections too, and, and what sort of testing other collections have done for Adam or Cortex hosted collections, because we are not the only people who have signed on and piloted and tried out Cortex tools. But for our point, from our point of view, um, we focused in this presentation and generally more on the construction side and less on the user perspective. So all we have at the moment is the quantitative numbers, which we'd have to report back on. But I think, Carolyn, do you have anything to add to that? 
No, yeah, I think I think that's right. I think the focus of our project was a bit more um, like uh, kicking the tires, so to speak, of just testing out this software and how it would apply to our collections um, from a very tech, like sort of the more tech uh, point of view. But um, we haven't done as much of an analysis of the user, the user experience, I would agree. Thank you. Um, Jenny, do you have any comments? Yeah, and I think it's interesting in terms of um, I see myself as a user quite often and 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 actually what I want to use AI for is to kind of you know before the user before the end users do search and discovery there's the archivist search and discovery and that's about kind of trying to get a grip with you know moving these records from live business I'm thinking more of an archivist here that's my background from the live business systems into the something that is the archive system and I think that's quite interesting because email is quite an interesting example from this because what we're actually doing is we're kind of moving the entire live business system with it so that all of the kind of contextual information that Stephanie was talking about is kind of built into that system and we can port it through but how can we perhaps use that um you know it, it if 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 a user is interested in the same sort of thing that an archivist is interested in which is kind of understanding the workings of a company understanding how the kind of functioning of that organization has led to those records or is documented in those records then we have a kind of common purpose and we can probably use the same tools to do that so i think it's quite it's quite useful to have that kind of um, renegotiation. I was talking about renegotiation of boundaries. And I think one of those is actually about kind of recognizing that quite often we're doing the same sort of, we're interested in the same sort of thing. Um, and we want to kind of get the same intelligence and the same insights from this data. Um, and so I think that's quite an interesting development. And it will, you know, it, it, it's it's easy when it's kind of maybe, well, it's easy, Stephanie, it's not easy, sorry. But it's easy when it's like in an email sort of system. But when you're trying to, bring that sort of coherence and, and that context between an email system, what's going on in, you know, other formats in, in SharePoint, in whatever, it, it becomes harder. And, and how do you kind of gain that insight and that coherence over, over the whole of it? So I think it's really exciting. I mean, I'm really excited by some of these, what's happening in some of the live business systems and the sort of things that are being created that could actually be ported through so that the user has access to them. Um, for research purposes at a later date, but how, what we port and how we port it, that's the question for me. Thank you, yeah, that's absolutely right. Stephanie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, you asked about the availability of the data sets. So, um, I mean, we're basically working here with two email data sets. The first one from the first project is um, a company we cannot name and is under pseudonym. So we're calling it Aurora Tech. And obviously all the individuals have to be anonymized. I mean, this data set is available on the Linguistic Data Consortium, um, but that's really available as a data set. And I think the problem that we found is, well, that, that's great that you have a data set available if you don't know what to do with that data set. As a person curious about what's in there, that's very problematic. Plus you're not actually allowed to use it in quite the same way. So um, as part of the first project, we created um, a website that's a little bit of, a, of an exhibition of these emails. So that's what I posted in, in the chat, uh, the .com archive. And we used the first prototype of the tool to kind of find our way around the emails and tell a couple of stories about the business and what they were doing, and what were the things that generated all these emails. But bear in mind, all, all of this is anonymized. So we anonymized all the names and we anonymize the company and we're trying to give as much context as we can and we use narrative to give the whole thing a context which is the dot-com boom and bust and use the story as as a sort of as a way of showing the organizational side of being maybe not one of the winners of the dot-com boom which is where we see the historical significance of, of some of these resources because all that information is in email the second one is the enron email data set now that's been available for years and again, I mean, many a researcher has downloaded it. And if you don't do large scale computational analysis, it's not super user friendly. So we're really trying to design the, the tool to make it more findable. And we know a couple of people. So Adam on our project has worked with the Enron Corpus and we know other people really struggle making use in, in qualitative sense of, of those emails. So um, I think David posted earlier that once we actually have the test environment ready, which we hope to have ready in August, we're happy to share that with people because we really want to see whether that makes it easier for people to use uh, and whether it works the way we're hoping it does. So data sets, yeah, sometimes they're there, but even when they're there, they're not terribly useful to researchers. And that's really the problem we want to look at. 
That's right. Thank you. So people will be looking forward to the tool uh, becoming available on a larger scale. Um, uh, going back to the HDR project, um, we've got um, a question about um, the searchability and how uh, do you approach searchability with regards to archaic language or spellings? Is it something that you've come up against? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one as well, and then perhaps throw it back to Stephanie's team, because their tool actually is solving a lot of those questions in that, uh, or it seems to be addressing that when you're looking for something, but you don't necessarily know the, the language or vocabulary used in the corpus in which you're searching. Um, for our part, our colleague that I quoted at the end of our talk, Ellis, um, we also work together to create a search guide um, that's at the beginning of our fur trade collection. And then, and we didn't do the same level of work with the, Don, the Doncaster project, but for the fur trade collection in particular, we focused um, that tool on um, the exonyms versus the names that indigenous groups called themselves as they self-identified. Um, so that was in some ways the closest stab that we have towards um, archaic language because for the moment, um, all of the indigenous groups in this collection are identified as the names that the Francophone or Anglophone European um, fur traders and merchants as they were identified by those people groups, not by the language specific names that those groups used to identify themselves. So if you're searching for something, you may not be using the right vocabulary as it was used in the collection. So what we did was create a search guide um, and pointed to other resources where you could find appropriate search terms. We also pointed out to the pretty well-documented search um, well, the search documentation provided by Cortex itself, because they wrote the best manual and using their own tool. So rather than pointing, um, creating new things, we use the extensive documentation that they provided as well. But I, as this question, I saw it come up in the Q&A and I was like, oh, as I was listening to Stephanie's talk, I was like, they're addressing part of this in, a, of course, a different corpus. But that tool um, and the way that it functions is something that probably would be worth looking into for the archaic language question as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. And uh, from this, um, I just wanted to go back to something that in a way you all spoke about, um, but Jenny, I think you powerfully made the point about um, the level of, um, of effort, of resources, of time that goes into these things. And obviously, uh, it, it, it's you know, the, the, the lot of labor that also went into the HDR project and in the, the email archives. So I was just wondering whether um, people can comment a little bit about it, um, whether there is a sweet spot of, um, uh, you know, a good balance. Uh, I suppose that the, the short answer <laughs> is probably not. Um, but um, uh, yes, when is it that we feel we uh, have perhaps, perhaps reached the point in which previous efforts are feeding into um, uh, future efforts and becoming a bit more uh, effective and efficient and when is it worth doing and when not and uh, what kind of expectations also we are setting up for ourselves, our organizations and, and our users uh, um, eventually. Uh, so perhaps Jenny, can, can I start with you? Um, yes, no, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, I think it's this kind of usability arms race you know, everything, everything I've got in my collection is usable, most well, and that's not true. Most of things in the collection are usable, but it may be that you have to come to queue <laughs> to use them, right? Everything is usable. So it's kind of what level of the usability. So I don't know that there's a sweet spot. I don't know where it is. Um, where you put your resource is always a choice. Those choices, you know, exclude some, include others. Um, it, it's it's tough. So I think we're going to just, you know, that's a constant negotiation and that constant negotiation is going to be, have to be ongoing. I think where I kind of try to see more optimism, perhaps, and, and this is possible in this archival space, is that things are now being born digital. And it may be that I can, you know, if I can get upstream and I can solve the problem upstream so that we don't have to then expend all of this resource when they're coming through so that we don't have to do all of this conversion again and again and again. We can bring things in in the right way that means that we can use them 
in the right way, if you see what I mean. So I think in some ways that's where I kind of see the hope that, I mean, I do think that, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of money involved in sort of big tech and there's a lot of money involved in sort of current business systems and that's where the money is and that's where people perhaps have the resources to develop some of these techniques and to develop these kind of sense-making kind of AI that allows people to kind of get a sense of their material and insights over there. And if I can kind of, use some of that artifact and bring them across so that I don't have to do that, then they'll be available for others longer term. So I think that's perhaps where I see a hope. So is there a sweet spot? No. Um, is there a possibility perhaps in some some kind of aspects of GLAM, particularly where we're kind of moving into that, you know, when, when the stuff that we're dealing with is born digital, is now born digital, maybe we might be able to leverage some of that. Thank you. Um, Stephanie, as well as your team, um, your, your other colleagues have now come on video, David and, and, and Shanti, please chip in if you, um, if you would like to share your views. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm, I'm sure David and Shanti have um, something to say on that as well, but I thought the, for us, the key question is, is not just a sweet spot, but also where's the responsibility, right? Is that with the people who curate the resource or is that with the people who are going to search the resource? And at the moment, the people who are actually going to be using the resource, as in not the people managing the resource who also use it, obviously, um, they're very, very different in terms of technical ability. And this is really why we went with the digitally curious, you know, people who may have some idea, but they're not really computing scientists. And maybe in the future, this is not going to be a problem because the classic training for everybody will be that they're an information management specialist in like 30, 40 years from now. I don't know. But um, in the meantime, it's also a question of should an archive give us these tools or should we as researchers come with that tool? And I think that's this, this, this thing about both sides of the search room. We're not clear who's supposed to be doing what for whom. And as Jenny said, who's going to be included and excluded by these choices. So I'm um, just seeing if David or, or Shanti would like to come in on that. Probably I could go, sorry. Go, go ahead, sorry. Shanti. Probably I could answer that to Jenny a bit. This is already all these tech giants, they are doing this because they have got huge amounts of processing power and huge amounts of capabilities to do the kind of the, with the latest technologies and research kind of thing. We are having, we are getting this open source packages and open source resources to use for us. So one of the one, one such resource that is the BERT embeddings we have used for our search facility in order to work with. So it is happening, but again, it depends on what the end, end user requires. And also like it is how you pro, how we process the how we ingest our archives in what way that depends on the what the end user wants. So like, uh, I mean, on this, uh, on this and until we know the end user, like we have to get a feedback from the end user to really do the processing at the source. So probably it is a loop and it would take some time to stabilize. Thank you. David, you were about to comment. Yeah, I just, I, I think to underscore both this, the digitally curious piece, right? That this is where I think it's, it's not just a sweet spot, it's a big kind of mess of <laughs> opportunity and, and, and challenge in the middle here. Um, and, and I think that's why both were kind of excited, but also a little daunted about what, what lies ahead. Uh, um, and, and just to underscore Santi's point, you know, when, you know, th there's now all, the, all these variations on the BERT embeddings. So when we started a couple of years ago, BERT was the state of the art and Santi was the state of the artist. Um, and, and now, of course, it's, you know, Robert, Robert and Berta and Roberta and all that, you know, so the, the, that, that kind of, um, the, the, uh, if you will, the, um, kind of forefront of the technology keeps moving and, and, then, you know, does that change our capability? How, how important is that? Our focus has really been on the user, trying to center the user and the user experience and the kinds of questions that users want to ask. So I, hopefully that, um, <laughs> uh, by focusing on that, we don't, you know, kind of lose the, um, the, the, 
the lead dog, if you will, um, in, in the technology game. Definitely, and that issue around skills that has kept on coming up. A uh, number of sessions, or literally all the sessions I've attended at the DC, DC conference and keeping up to that. Uh, Jacqueline and Caroline, did you have any um, other comments? No, okay. Thank you. <laughs> the only uh, thing that I thought of... In terms of the, yeah, sorry. Uh, the only thing I thought of in terms of um, going back to the question of the sweet spot of balance between the effort that you put in and the reward or the, the work and where that balance is, I think the only thing that comes to mind with our particular um, project is actually the point that Carolyn made about the archival groundwork and the descriptive groundwork that was done and how that made this particular application forward compatible, much less work than the initial description. So we give an enormous shout out to the people who originally created the finding aid and descriptions for all of that collection. But that's, it's a lot of work, but now that collection is usable in a way that is future compatible as well. Um, so that was my only other point that there is a sweet spot. The effort pays off when you take that as a cleaned sort of usable data set to use for future projects. 